My name's Debbie Friedman. I'm the chair of MAMAS, uh, formerly Mothers of Marin Against the Spray, and we're a co-sponsor of this forum tonight. And, sorry, MAMAS is a new nonprofit dedicated to the creation of a healthy, non-toxic environment for the children of Marin County in the greater Bay Area. MAMAS began as an effort by four Marin mothers to organize and prevent the state's planned aerial uh, pesticide spraying program to eradicate the light brown apple moth which you'll hear more about tonight. Within two months, MAMA's membership grew, up, grew to nearly 500 concerned parents and families and rallies, meeting with federal politicians, press coverage and telev television appearances followed. The state canceled its aerial spraying uh, plans for urban areas, but the energy was unleashed. So MAMA's new goal is to create a healthier environment for our children by reducing the use of common household toxins and pesticides through education and outreach and advocacy. With scientific data emerging every day linking childhood diseases and long-term health effects to common toxins found in our air, water, fields, and homes, MAMA's will educate the public at events like this one tonight about the risks of common toxins and promote healthier alternatives support behavior changes, and help develop policies to promote environmental health. And the other co-sponsor tonight is uh, Mothers Advocating for Children's Health, Mock Sonoma. And Mock Sonoma is also an organization that was formed in response to the planned aerial pesticide spraying in the Bay Area. Uh, Mock Sonoma has grown into a membership organization of mothers, teachers, and community organizers. It advocates for healthy children, a healthy environment, healthy farmers, and healthy farms. Mock Sonoma maintains that the light brown apple moth eradication program is not safe, necessary, or effective. The organization opposes the burdensome paperwork, punitive quarantines, and the costly treatment protocols imposed on growers. Mock Sonoma believes that the light brown apple moth eradication program has falsely pitted farmers against children, Mock Sonoma strives to preserve Sonoma's vibrant and essential agricultural economy while supporting good land stewardship. And uh, Unique, wherever you are, you were a master, and thank you for all of your hard work. And our other sponsors tonight, um, Scott Mateusen, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, from Laguna Farms in Sebastopol. Scott has been farming organically for 25 years. And the unique thing about his farm is the diversity of the crops and its program focusing on sustainable farm energy. This includes using waste vegetable oil for fueling the tractors, 18 kilowatts of solar energy to run the irrigation pump, and cool straw bale insulated walk-in cooler. Recently, the farm has added an electric Ford Ranger delivery vehicle. Scott is the director of this grand adventure called Laguna Farms, and thank you, Scott, um, for co-sponsoring our event tonight. And Laguna Farms is presently quarantined because of the light brown apple moth. Our other co-sponsor is Paul Wirtz from Oak Hill Farm. Paul has been farming in Sonoma Valley for more than 20 years, and he has been with Oak Hill since 2001. He's always farmed organically, but has never been certified. And last year, part of uh, Oak Hill Farm was quarantined because of light brown apple moth. Um, both Paul and Scott will be free to answer questions during the Q&A on how the quarantines will affect them. So I'd like to turn this forum over to the mayor, Ken Brown, mayor of Sonoma. Thank you, mayor, for taking the time to be with us tonight. Thank you. First of all, it's a pleasure to uh, be here. It's a pleasure to be the mayor of Sonoma. We are basically a agricultural community. We have been for an extremely long time. The city council voted four to one on the no spray issue. Um, we hope to continue to support and have the support of the council members for any further endeavors. I'm finishing my 11th year here on the council. I worked and lived in this building for 25 years. I'm very comfortable uh, here at the community center. This is a wonderful nonprofit and they have a great fundraiser coming up on Saturday, so it's out in the lobby. Um, this guy over here, Frank, um, is a role model for all elected officials who are determined never to have term limits. Um, right? Yeah. Uh, Seven-time mayor of Fairfax, the first California Coastal Commissioner appointed under Prop 20, served 
um, both Sonoma and Marin counties from 1972 to 81. Former Teamster Union President served 10 four-year terms, the California state record. Um, I don't think anybody's going to get close. I'm too old to get that close to you, Frank. Um, and he is the longest serving elected official in California history. Uh, Frank just got back from Italy, so he's taking care of himself quite nicely. And he today sits on two public agency boards and three nonprofits, probably working harder than he ever did before. So it's with a great pleasure that I welcome to Sonoma and to this venue and to this meeting, Frank. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Some of you may, have, may see me in Sonoma County from time to time. You're wondering, what's this politician from Marin doing up here in Sonoma County? Um, my family first came to the West County in the 20s. Uh, they put a small vineyard up above the Russian River, and uh, we've been property owners and, and part-time residents in Sonoma County ever since. Uh, I graduated from Santa Rosa JC in 1960. My wife, Ronita, graduated from Montgomery High School in Santa Rosa. And um, we've, uh, we, we, we love this county, and that's why we're here so much. But um, to get on with our program this evening, many of you read or heard or saw a television story about the light brown apple moth. And it, uh, this program of eradication started in uh, 2007. It was uh, put together by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the California Department of Food and Ag. The, uh, the federal government made $500 million of Homeland Security money available to the state of California to supplement their budget for them to uh, take on this uh, a program of eradication to, uh, to protect California agriculture from the light brown apple moth, which they said over and over again would devastate agriculture in, in California. Monterey and Santa Cruz counties uh, were sprayed in September and October from fixed wing aircraft with a, with a pesticide called Checkmate. People started organizing down there. Uh, the, the EPA said, don't worry, Checkmate is safe, safe for the environment, safe for people, yeah, it's safe for the fish, um, there's no problem, it's safe for crops. And some folks in Monterey and Santa Cruz were really skeptical, and they said, you know, we don't think it's safe. We're really worried. Tell us what the inert ingredients are. And, and, and by golly, they found out what the inert ingredients were. The inert ingredients were published. Uh, the owner of, of uh, the pesticide company, Sutera, actually went, went about uh, threatening lawsuits against folks in Santa Cruz and Monterey County that were emailing out the inner ingredients. They said, this is a trade secret and you can't do this. Um, well, they never actually filed a lawsuit, but the word was out as to what those ingredients were. And it turns out uh, they weren't safe. A lawsuit was filed in federal court in San Francisco last year. And um, in, in the evidence uh, supporting the lawsuit, um, it showed that uh, of the 11 inert ingredients, one was a carcinogen, one was a mutagen, one was an endocrine disruptor, and the fourth was called TMAC. TMAC, and I can't pro quite pronounce it, it's triapical methyl ammonium chloride. And it turns out that product can't be used on a conventional food product or crop let alone organic. And what, what the USDA and CDFA did is they tried to get the farmers in, in those counties on board by promising to, to save their, uh, their organic status for them. They would not lose their organic status if their crops were sprayed with this safe pesticide called Checkmate, when in fact uh, that pesticide should have been used on any, any food product at all. So it, you know, they, they proposed it for, uh, for the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, and, and folks just, it was a massive uprising. Uh, marched on Sacramento, marched across the Golden Gate Bridge, marched on Sacramento, and the state backed off. They're now preparing an environmental impact report on this new eradication program that they're gonna try to put together um, from and, and some of our speakers tonight will tell you about it, that they want to use a sterile uh, uh, insect technology uh, where they would spray 20 million moths every week or so, uh, sterile moths, uh, like out of an airplane, you know, uh, in order to, uh, to, to uh, I guess, to neutralize the, the, the moth population. Uh, 
they're going to create a problem if they do something insane like that. They're really going to create the problem. They want to Sonoma County have 40 maws, and they're going to drop millions of maws in your county, and, and they think there's going to be no, no adverse impact? Wow. So anyway, um, here we are tonight. Uh, the CDFA is threatening quarantines on our county here. Our county, I consider Sonoma my county too because I'm a property owner here. Uh, the quarantines, um, they're holding our farmers hostage. And, um, and, and we're looking at all of the options. And it's really important that you listen to these experts this evening, and I'll introduce them. And they're going to tell you a little bit about uh, the light brown apple moth, about uh, the eradication program, um, and, uh, and, and where we're going uh, from here. Um, it's, uh, it, they, the, the CDFA could do severe damage to Sonoma County farmers if, if they continue this quarantine. And, and we're looking at all the options available to us. Uh, the North Coast Rivers Alliance, a board, on a, it's a board that I sit on, and Stop the Spray groups have their attorneys looking at options uh, to file lawsuits, file against the CDFA and USDA. Um, and, and the issue, there's two issues. Uh, one is to overturn the, Ap the Apple Moth Class A uh, designation we believe we can overturn it in court. The second is, is in effect to attack the quarantines that they're using. We believe that uh, the quarantines are unlawful underground regulations and that all CDFA actions taken to enforce the unlawful quarantines are civil rights violations of the affected property owners. So we're going to stand with the farmers in Sonoma County. So, okay, let's get on with our program. Our first speaker this evening is James Carey. Dr. Carey is a professor and former vice chair in the Department of Entomology at the University of California, Davis. He's also the director of a National Institute on Aging funded program concerned with basic research on the biology and demography of aging involving scientists at 11 research institutes ranging from Stanford, Berkeley, and UC Santa Barbara here in California to Imperial College in London and Max Planck Institute in in Rostock, Germany. Dr. Carey first, is the first entomologist in the history of University of California Academic Senate to chair the prestigious University Committee on Research Policy, a standing committee of 10 campus UC Academic Council whose mission is to foster, formulate, coordinate, revise general research policies and procedures and advise the UC president on research matters affecting the university. Professor Carey has served on the CDFA's MedFly Scientific Advisory Panel for seven years, from 1987 to 1994, and he also testified on the MedFly crisis in the state to the California Legislature Committee on the whole 17 years ago. So he's, he has extensive background in, in eradication programs. Um, with respect to Alabama last year, Professor Carey presented testimony to the California Senate Environmental Quality Committee, the Assembly Agriculture Committee, and the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, and has served on numerous panels concerned with Alabama, Alabama eradication policy. And it, I, I would say that Dr. Carey is one of the premier entomologists in the Western United States, so uh, we're really pleased to have Jim with us this evening. Uh, Jim Carey, please. Welcome, Jim, Thank you. to Sonoma. I knew that introduction was too long, uh, but anyway, um, I'd like to thank uh, Yannick Phillips first, She's and also Debbie, Helen, and uh, Paulina for, for inviting me, uh, Frank Eager and uh, Ken Brown both for attending here, and uh, of course all of you for attending. Uh, let me start out just with a, a brief background here, because the way I got into this was uh, when I first arrived at uh, UC Davis in 1980, 29 years ago. It's unbelievable. But anyway, uh, about four months later, that is in June of 1980, they captured a medfly in, uh, in Santa Clara County. And uh, so I was teaching insect ecology at the time. I, wrote, I developed a uh, handout for my class on the medfly, some current event, and so forth. And, uh, you know, as they say, it's all history from there. But uh, I, 
what ha and then I was funded to do some medfly research in Greece and uh, Hawaii, and then in 1987 I was asked to be on the panel when they recaptured the medfly. And from there uh, I developed uh, this expertise in uh, invasion biology, so that you think of, uh, I think of it, you can understand a virus but not the disease. You can understand the medfly or the LBAM in this case without understanding the invasion process. These are different domains, and so that's where I come from. Would be the uh, would be the invasion concepts, and uh, uh, so in '87 uh, to '94, I was on the CDFA scientific advisory panel, and that's where I came from. These look, I have a lot of respect. I have colleagues and friends of the USDA and uh, CDFA still, and even though I, we don't see things the same way, I, I come at it. Uh, uh, I believe the MedFly is still established, and uh, and uh, anyway, that's a perspective I'm bringing to the uh, table here in uh, uh, with LBAM. Look, there's uh, 2,500 MedFlies have all been captured in the state. That's there's they spent about uh, a quarter of a billion dollars on eradication. You could put those 2,500 in this uh, uh, plastic cup uh, or paper cup right up here, and uh, uh, but I plotted each one of those to the uh, property. And so it's from there that I developed this uh, concept that eradication, I mean, this is no surprise, but eradication is incredibly difficult. And when we talk about LBAM, we're not talking about a, an LBAM population, whether it's in Sonoma or in California. We're talking about 100,000 populations, 500,000 populations, because it's similar to metastatic cancer. Anything short of 100% uh, effectiveness, which, of course, is very difficult even in theory, is really control. And so that uh, uh, this idea that, uh, the, that LBAM can be eradicated from uh, this county or from the state is simply uh, a non-starter in my view. I'm going to uh, read a letter, or just the first part of a letter, that uh, my two colleagues, Frank Zalem, some of you may have heard of. He's one of the premier entomologists uh, in, the, in the world, to be honest with you, with IPM. He's a former director of the uh, UC State, uh, statewide I, uh, IPM program. And then Bruce Hammock, another colleague at Davis. He's the National Academy of Scientists, uh, distinguished professor at uh, Davis, and then myself. So we sent this letter. It, it turned out I just checked the date. One year ago, uh, yesterday, is when we sent this to the Secretary of Agriculture, Edward Schaefer, uh, at the USDA. Dear Secretary Schaefer, <clears throat> we are writing to express our concerns with the eradication program in California directed against LBAM uh, that the uh, CDFA and the USDA launched last year in Monterey County and that is scheduled to expand to other LBAM infested counties in mid-August. We submit, one, the data supporting the argument that LBAM will become a pest uh, that is more economically important than the species of uh, tortricid leafhoppers that are already in the uh, California is unconvincing. Two, there, are, there is no scientific evidence that using the method of mating disruption via pheromones, either uh, alone or with augmentative methods, that is like release of natural enemies, is capable of eradicating any insect population. The same argument would hold, so that's the, uh, there's more to the letter, but that's the uh, main part. Uh, the same thing holds for this uh, sterile insect technique. There's absolutely no evidence that this will ever work. I'm familiar with this because we did this with a medfly. And it's a, 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 again, it's a matter of if you have uh, 500,000 different populations, you have to get to every single one. And this technology simply uh, is not up to the job. I, I, I don't speak and I don't pretend to speak for every entomologist uh, by any means. On the other hand, I'm, I've been in this uh, uh, system, that is UC, for 29 years now. I know most, almost all of the entomologists in the state. I have to say there's, there's not one entomologist that believes uh, this pest can be eradicated, and everybody I've talked to also agrees with uh, this letter that this should not be a pest. Uh, it should not be a Class A pest. It's no different than any number of tortricids we have in the state. Okay, good. So I'll stop there and uh, uh, go to my... Uh, back to Frank, I guess, and the uh, other, other colleagues or panelists here. Thank you. Okay, excellent, excellent. Next, we've got Daniel Harder. And uh, Daniel is the executive director of the Arboretum at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, Dan is also uh, an expert in, in his field. And it, you know what's really interesting is we have two two current uh, professors from the UC system here, um, and they don't agree 
with some of their colleagues in, in, in other uh, departments of, here in the state of California. So um, they're pretty brave to be able to stand up to the system. Um, but they're here today. You know, they're, they're here today to, 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 to bring truth to power, and they want to let you know what, what, what reality is here in California. Um, Dan uh, has been involved internationally uh, for a number of years. He traveled to Madagascar and Ghana, he was a coordinator for botanical collections of over 10,000 samples for anti-cancer, anti-AIDS activity for the National Cancer Institute. He's been involved in numerous international and national endeavors that sent him to Vietnam, Congo, the Congo, Hawaii, Zambia, and New Zealand. In 2007, uh, Dan and Jeff Rosendale, a grower and horticultural consultant in, in uh, California, both traveled to New Zealand. They spent one month researching um, the light brown apple moth. Now, uh, New Zealand and Australia had problems with the light brown apple moth, and Dan will tell you about it, but um, they spent time researching it, and they came back home to California and said, you know what? It's really not a problem. Um, Additionally, uh, Dan co-authored with Roy Upton, the Citizens for Health and Others, the Alabama Eradication Program, in quote, formal petition to reclassify Alabama as a non-actionable pest. And that's what we've got to do. And Dan will tell you why we have to do it. Um, it's also called the Citizens Reclassification Petition. This document was sent to the CDFA and USDA in September of 2008. Professor Harder has been on countless panels during aerial spraying in Santa Cruz and Monterey, as well as during the plant aerial spray to San Francisco Bay Area counties, including our, our neighbors to the South Marin County. You may view both of the latest Alabama related publications and his complete list of other worthy endeavors on the literature table in the rear. Uh, please welcome Dan Harbour, Harder, Executive Director of Arboretum. Thank you, Frank, and thank, thank the organizers for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, my interest in the LBAM was personal and professional in that the Arboretum maintains a large collection of inter international plants as well as California native plants, and my concern is for the health of that collection. When LBAM was heralded as being a pest of Australian and New Zealand plants, we have a large collection of both of those continents, uh, including wild collected material for many, many years, decades. Uh, we weren't seeing this. We weren't seeing what they were saying. Leaf rollers are a minor problem for us. Um, but because of the quarantines and the restrictions around Alabama mo uh, movement of material, mostly containerized plants, uh, we sell plants for fundraising. And you know, of course, this year is really difficult to raise more money uh, by selling lots of plants. Uh, the restrictions on our quarantine allow us only to sell a limited number of plants through biweekly inspections. and. The quarantines prevent us from moving plants out of the area after uh, an LBAM is fined on the, on the premises. And we've refused, uh, despite CDFA's urgings, we've refused to do anything to deal with any insects that are not found on, uh, that are found in the collections alone. We have not done aerial spraying, we have not done area sprayings, we have maintained, in an effort to maintain the predator population that maintains leaf rollers. I mean, this is another leaf roller. We're seeing it attacked by a variety of different kinds of insects. This is borne out in New Zealand as well as in recent studies by, funded by CDFA that uh, a, a larger number of parasites and par predators munch on these things at various stages of their life cycle. It's a food, it's a food insect for predators and keeps those, ele those populations elevated. Uh, because we're you know, of the quarantines, we've lost about 40% of our revenue from sales of plants. We were down, people aren't buying them, we can't provide that many. And so because the cost to produce them goes up with the sprays and the implications of, of going through getting them LBAM free to the level of CDFA inspections. We're also involved in a University of California cooperative extension program to uh, deal with small nurseries, working on protocols for integrative pest management, but their, their, their experiments are failing in, in attracting LBAM because the level and numbers of LBAM are way low. I mean, they're not high enough to, to get any kind of practical information. LBAM can cause damage. You know, in Watsonville, there are cane crops that are undercover uh, where LBAM can come, become a slight problem, but it doesn't decimate crops. It doesn't wipe out entire rows of crops. 
It's very easy to treat. The New Zealanders sh showed to us that we can meet export requirements to any country, given the protocols the New Zealanders use to, to eradicate it. They've been doing it to send apples here for years. They've got all the protocols, and they stopped publishing on it about 10 years ago because it's no longer a problem. It's not, it's not an interesting subject. It's not causing them any problems. And they can control it. That's what we need to do here, move to control away from this crazy attempt to eradicate. If I talk about the SIT program a little bit, the sterile insect technology, the proposal that they're going to prepare and drop 10 million sterile moss, they've got to separate, of course, the males and the females, so uh, half of the, if they're not separate, half of them will be, will be males and half of them will be females, hopefully fully sterile. Uh, uh, but to consider if they're dropping 10 million moss and the entire program has come up with 35,000 moss total, uh, this, is, this is an amazing effort, and I've heard they're having trouble uh, getting the moths to be eradicated, uh, irradiated with, they use cobalt-60, they expose them to radiation and during their development and causes them to be fully sterile. Um, but, you know, dropping these little moths with scales all over insects, if you bump these things, they get them all over your hands. You know, they're going to drop them out of planes going 120 miles an hour out of tubes. And to expect them to fly down and compete with the natively grown moss as good, you know, the, the stud service, powerful, you know, displacing these things. Jim Carrey indicated to me that in tortricids, the, the, the males will actually sit outside the pupa cases because they know there's a female inside and they will wait till she emerges so she can mate. One of the problems with the SIT program is that uh, light brown apple moth females mate multiple times. And that, if, they don't, if they're not effectively mated, mating a sterile moth, they will continue to mate until they actually get an egg load, and then they will, they will stop, but they'll continue to mate throughout their life cycle. So uh, I hope these 10 million moths are able to hang around long enough to survive, um, but the, the, the logistics are out there. It's just an incredible, uh, it, it can't work, uh, even using sterile insect technology. Um, I did author the New Zealand report, and I did author the, pe the petition. We're concerned that uh, our submission to USDA, uh, our submission to USDA is being, has been summarized by USDA and passed on uh, from National Academy of Sciences and passed back to USDA as a review of what we were submitted, not the petition itself. So we're asked Sam Farr's office to find out what information was actually forwarded. And I, I look forward to questions because I, I, I really want to deal with what your issues are and what you're thinking. But uh, it's not going to work. It's not necessary. And it might not be safe. Thank you, Dan. You know, we did uh, invite the California Department of Food and Ag to participate in our forum this evening. And uh, they have declined. Uh, they said they're going to be releasing an environmental impact report uh, sometime in June on the whole eradication program. And I guess maybe that's why they declined. Um, but uh, they're not here this evening. I don't think. Is anyone here from CDFA this evening? I haven't seen anyone. Okay. Our next speaker is Carolyn Cox. And uh, Carolyn is the research director at the Center for Environmental Health in Oakland. She leads the, the, the Health Center's research on toxic exposures. She identifies, analyzes, and then substantiates a scientific basis for the work of the center to eliminate threats to children and others exposed to dangerous chemicals in, in consumer products. Carolyn, Carolyn currently serves as public interest representative to the United States EPA Pesticide Program Dialogue Committee. For the last 16 years, she worked as staff scientist of the Northwest Coalition for Alternatives to Pesticides. That's NCAP. So if you want a little more information, when you go home, you can Google NCAP and just a wealth of information on that website. They're based in Oregon. In addition, as a senior research assistant at Oregon State University for close to a decade, she conducted scientific research on the biological control of agricultural weeds. She writes and speaks regularly as a national expert on toxicity and alternatives to pesticides. Carolyn has a master's degree in entomology from Oregon State University and is a graduate of Swarthmore College. As far as the center itself, their accomplishments are great, and although they were too numerous to mention this evening, one of the victories was leading the investigation and exposing a threat in children's jewelry. Their lawsuit spurred the largest product recall in U.S. history and led to a landmark agreement with, with numerous folks from Macy's to Target and Walmart. Um, 
The center also forced Walmart and Toys R Us to remove lead-contaminated baby bibs and worked in tandem with the Environmental Health Coalition to eliminate lead in Mexican candies, which prompted Hershey's and Mars to change their production practices here and abroad. This is much more, this and much more is because of the center staff great work and Carolyn de de Carolyn's detailed uh, research. Please welcome Carolyn Cox, research director. Thanks to everybody who worked hard to organize this forum and all of you who are here tonight to um, talk about this important issue. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, from Jim and Dan who did a great job talking about the, the apple moth itself and I'm going to talk about the pesticides that um, are uh, planned for use. Um, although we don't have details yet about exactly what would happen in Sonoma, um, at least our, you know, our best guess about what might happen here. Um, I wanted to start by just um, covering some basics about pesticides in general, sort of what you need to know when you think about this issue, because it may be new for some folks. Um, one of the things about pesticides is that they're a very special group of chemicals. They're chemicals that are designed to kill or damage living things. And the only other group of chemicals that I can think with that specific focus are um, chemical warfare agents. Um, but so, I mean, you can think of them as designed to kill and you're not too far off. Um, another thing that's really unique about pesticides, and this was um, actually first uh, written down by the National Academy of Sciences, who um, in the 1990s in, in one of their books said, um, it's probably the only class of toxic chemicals that we intentionally put out into the environment. Most toxic chemicals are byproducts or whatever, but pesticides we actually put out into the world. Uh, another thing that we've learned about pesticides in the last 10 or 20 years is that they are everywhere. Um, the U.S. Geological Survey has been uh, monitoring streams and rivers across the country. Um, they find pesticides in between 90 and 100 percent of the samples that they take. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture looks for pesticides in food every year. Um, the most recent study, and it's not different from what they usually find, they found pesticides in about three quarters of the samples of common foods that they tested. Um, when the Centers for Disease Control looks for pesticides in people's bodies, um, they f um, typically don't find the pesticides themselves. What they find are breakdown products, and um, there's a, a, a fairly impressive list of pesticides for which more than half, a, half of us are carrying those pesticides in our bodies at any given moment. Um, another thing that we've learned about pesticides is that they cause um, significant health problems. Um, one of the best, best studies of pesticides and health it's called the Agricultural Health Study. It's done by a collaboration of government agencies, but led by the National Cancer Institute. And they're looking at 50,000 farmers in North Carolina and Iowa, looking at their pesticide use and their health. And the things that they've found that are um, linked to pesticide use are various kinds of cancer, which um, maybe is not surprising because I think a lot of people have heard that news, but then a lot of things that people may not have thought of. Um, depression, a variety of other neurological problems, um, retinal degeneration, which I don't know who would have expected that, um, asthma and, and, and other symptoms of breathing problems, diabetes, um, changes in uh, menstrual cycles of women. And the, the last thing that I'll mention about pesticides in general is that um, many people know that pesticides are tested before they're sold in this country. And what a lot of people don't know is what all the problems with that testing are. Uh, the first thing is um, the government doesn't test pesticides, although many people think that's the case. Pesticide testing is done by the companies that sell pesticides. 
Um, if that's not a conflict of interest, I, I don't know what is. Um, there are many um, important health effects that have been linked to pesticide exposure, like um, the diabetes that I mentioned, like the depression that I mentioned, like the asthma that I mentioned, um, effects on hormones, uh, behavioral problems like ADHD, which are not included in the testing of pesticides. Um, almost all pesticides are actually a mixture of different ingredients. I think Frank mentioned this a little bit. Um, but pesticide testing is done by um, mostly on one chemical at a time. Am I out of time? Um, uh, and many t for biopesticides, which is the, the class of pesticides that are, have been proposed for use with the apple moth, um, many tests are waived. Um, I'll just say a couple things, um, if I can, really quickly. Um, one of the pesticides that will probably be used in Sonoma County, or our best guess, is um, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a bacteria that kills insects. Um, it's really closely related to uh, a another bacteria, Bacillus cereus, which is um, a common cause of food poisoning in people. Um, I just looked through the peer-reviewed literature in 2009 about BT and um, found a study where they looked at people with bacterial infections in hospitals, and lots of them actually had BT, and they found BT um, right on um, hospital equipment. Um, for the, um, mating, the apple moth mating pheromone, which will also be used here, um, we just plain don't know very much about it. Um, when EPA registered the chemical, they waived all the toxicology tests. Um, so there isn't a good way to find out very much about it. Um, and it does contain um, ingredients that, um, were, um, that we don't even know what they are. Um, Rachel Carson, who um, kind of started the public concern about pesticides in this country, has a wonderful quote, and I just wanted to end by reading that. Um, if the Bill of Rights contains no guarantee that a citizen shall be secure against lethal poisons distributed either by private individuals or public officials, it is surely only because our forefathers, despite their considerable wisdom and foresight, could conceive of no such problem. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Very informative. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit with you. And we're going to introduce a guy who makes a living off of buying food crops here in Sonoma County and, and reselling them to the public. Um, Chris Middlestadt is the founder and CEO of The Fruit Guys. He started his business wanting to help friends at work have an alternative to sodas and candy bars. His goodwill has certainly paid off, and his company has become the industry leader in providing healthy, farm, fresh, organic, as well as conventional produce to the American workplace. The Fruit Guys deliver fresh, seasonal fruit from California farmers to thousands of working Americans, ranging from small family-run businesses to Fortune 500 corporations, such as Yahoo, Wells Fargo, Yamaha, and others. The Fruit Guys was named one of the fastest growing businesses in the United States by Inc.com. The company has become very successful in the corporate world, but they have not forgotten the small farmers in the community they live in. In April of 2008, Chris launched the Farm Steward Program. To launch their program last year, the company donated 48,000 honeybees and hives to a small farmer right here in Sebastopol in Sonoma County. They have donated as well bat boxes to encourage bats to stay, multiply and eat mosquitoes and other insects, reducing the need for pesticides. In addition, they have donated 88,000 pounds of fresh fruit a year, which equals up to 7,000 pounds a month to, to nonprofits and folks that are unable to, to, to purchase these products for their families. It is clear that all, although the Fruit Guys has become a very successful business in delivering fresh fruit, the heart of the company is with the farmers. Please welcome Chris Middlestadt, the founder and CEO of The Fruit Guys. Hey, Chris, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're, uh, personally and, and as a company, we're very much committed to supporting small local family farms um, and interested in building a business that's very community-oriented and, and uh, both in terms of what we do and what we give back. 
So when the light brown apple moth issue um, came to first to Santa Cruz and Monterey and then um, sort of spread to San Francisco, we were very interested in getting involved and um, opposing uh, the spray as well as, you know, just taking a hard look at what this really means. So uh, tonight, uh, my role isn't really to talk much about the spray or about the science of any of this. I really have been addressing uh, this issue from the standpoint of an international trade issue and trying to point out to people that because countries such as New Zealand where there is no quarantine in effect um, can ship produce apples specifically into the United States without a quarantine on those apples um, and then domestic crop farmers locally are subject to quarantine issues here in the United States that you're creating an, an unfair trade situation that actually could potentially benefit foreign farmers over local domestic crop farmers. Um, and that's something we've been concerned about. And um, most of this is, is related to the way that the policy has been written and the things that we see that could be potential things if this gets out of control, to be honest, from a sort of from a policy standpoint. Um, the, uh, one, one of the things that, that we've, that we've uh, um, you know, been trying to do is, is talk specifically to uh, people that we, you know, we recognize that this may, may be beyond for this particular issue, may be beyond sort of a, a local ag issue and may be much more of a, of a federal and sort of state level issue in terms of taking a look from a policy standpoint at international trade and, and what that means. Um, one of the concerns we have is sort of time to market. Uh, we talked to a uh, importer of New Zealand uh, fruit that was telling us that their, their time to market from, you know, they're sort of proudly telling us that they could get apples from New Zealand and the United States and, and into market within three weeks, where the way the regulations are written currently, it could be as long as 30 days from a time of inspection that somebody could get their product into market here locally if they're, if they're quarantined. And again, that's, that's sort of concerning to us as well in terms of the way it's, the way it's structured. So that's, that's the gist of our argument. And, um, Thank you. <laughs> just to kind of back up what Chris just told you about the quarantines, how they're affecting our farmers and, and not affecting other countries. Uh, I just came from, uh, from Italy uh, and, and they grow lemons and apples and grapes, a lot of grapes. In fact, we, we visited some of the wineries. And uh, Alban, the light brown apple moth, is not uh, uh, a, a class A pest in Italy. There are no quarantines. Uh, they could care less about the light brown apple moth because it's done no damage in Italy at all. So uh, just another example as to how far off base our, our uh, USDA and CDFA are in treating our, our, our farmers and our residents here in California. Um, next we're going to introduce a person who, 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 who finds herself on the hot seat. Uh, quite often, but you know, when you take a government position, that's, that's what happens. Um, having been there and been on that hot seat, I, 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 I can tell you, sometimes it gets uncomfortable, but by golly, uh, uh, Sonoma County's new agricultural commissioner uh, is doing, a, uh, is doing a, a yeoman's job in trying to sort out this whole issue. Um, you know, she has, she has her certain uh, orders from the California Department of Food and Ag, and they've got, you know, a hand over what our uh, 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 County Ag Commissioners can and can't do. Um, so let's tell you a little bit about, about uh, our, our new Ag Commissioner here in Sonoma County, Kathy Novell. Kathy uh, begins her uh, uh, appointment as the Agricultural Commission, Commissioner of Sonoma County with the start of the new year. That's this year. We just, is it this year? Did we just start it? She comes from San Diego County, uh, where she worked in the Ag Commissioner's office. She was educated in uh, the University of New Hampshire. She has a bachelor's degree uh, of science in agriculture. She, she, as you said, she began a career in, in San Diego County as an insect trapper and found that she was fascinated by the work of Agri Agricultural Commissioner's Office. Um, she worked for the, for the County Department of, of, of Ag uh, as an um, agricultural biologist. Um, she worked with the commissioner and on the scaler of weights and measures 
those responsibilities and over the years has steadily rose to the ranks in San Diego County. And Kathy's excited about coming to Sonoma County. Um, and the first thing she's faced with is light brown apple moth. So uh, uh, we have to treat her very nicely tonight because she's, she's got a tough job. Um, but hopefully we could educate her a little bit about what's going on here in California with our farmers and, and the light brown apple moth. So uh, without further ado, Kathy Neville, thank you very much for coming with I want to thank you all for having me here, and I've been here about four and a half months. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Oh, you turn it on? Just pull close to you. Just get it. Hello? Can you hear me now? Well, I'm really happy to be here, and um, Light Brown Apple Moth is on my radar, and I'm here tonight. And I also want to get out and get to know the community, and I'm really committed to that. And with Light Brown Apple Moth, this has given me a great opportunity. As we are finding more and more light brown apple moths, I'm getting the opportunity to go out and meet with the different city councils and mayors and, and let them know about what our office does and what our commitment is to doing outreach and to the community and to the growers. We've recently held seven different outreach meetings with the growers. We want to help them move their product. We want to help them educate them on what they can do at this time. Because until the state completes their environmental impact report, nothing is being done. And, and my jurisdiction is in Sonoma County. And so that's where I would be regulating for quarantines. We also oversee and monitor any kind of pesticide use or misuse. We look at, we investigate if, if there's a problem and um, our office is very committed to that. And we oversee farmers markets and um, we oversee quite a few things. I'm also the sealer of weights and measures. I oversee the gas pumps, making sure that the measure is right, weighing and measuring devices. And I also oversee animal care and control, which has taken up a bit of my time and we're in the process of hiring a new director, which I'm really excited when that process is over because we're looking at doing a lot of great things there. But back to the light brown apple moth um, with the outreach. We have been working very hard to um, work with the growers and the aspect that the grape growers, we've come up with some best management practices that we've been working with UC Extension, that if they can come up with their own best management practice and they walk the vineyards before grape closure and don't find any of the larvae, they don't have to do any ridiculous sprays for that. And so I think that's a positive step for that. And um, so we are also going to be holding meetings with the wineries because we will also have to be placing them on compliance agreements. But the Ag Commissioner, in the late 1880s, um, grape phylloxera wiped out um, the um, grape industry. And it was in this, part of it was in this area. And with that, legislation came up with the quarantine officer and the agricultural commissioner and to be one that contains and controls when there are certain quarantine pests that happen. And although there, there isn't any eradication happening at this time, once the environmental impact report is done, the state is required by law to hold a public forum, which they will do, to discuss what treatments or methods they will use to try to eradicate. I, I don't know if they can do that. Um, but to at least contain and control. And that will be very transparent. And I know in this county it will be very transparent. So um, hopefully in June when those environmental impact reports are done, um, we will move forward and we will find out what, what methods the state will plan to use. But at this time, there, there is no eradication efforts happening that I know of. I know there aren't any happening in Sonoma. So um, that's really all I have on that subject. So. Great, thank you, Kathy. Last, lastly, but not last, well, Mike DeLay. Mike DeLay lives at Pacific Grove in Monterey County. And Mike DeLay and his wife were sprayed uh, by this CDFA um, last year, uh, 2007. So he'll tell you a little bit about his first-hand experience with, with, with the effects of the spray. Uh, 
He is the coordinator of the Coalition of California Cities to Stop the Spray, and that's a group of about 33 cities here in the San Francisco Bay Area and the Monterey, Santa Cruz Bay Area. Um, they came together, city councils in those, in those communities came together and, and opposed this, this eradication program, uh, and we were successful uh, last year, and, uh, and hopefully we're going to be able to uh, um, keep a lid on uh, the CDFA's new eradication program, and, and uh, uh, it'll be a non-toxic eradication program, even though they don't need one at all. <laughs> when Mike and his sisters were born, his parents lived uh, with the grandfather on a small farm in Orsi, California. His family moved uh, later and settled in Fresno, where he was raised. As a youth, during the summer, he worked in many different orchards and fields, picking fruit, fruit to suckering vines, thinning sugar beets to putting down raisin trays, rolling and collecting to picking uh, caprified figs. During the college years, also during summer months, he worked for Chevron Chemical Corporation as a field sweeper to inspect fields and orchards for insect infestation to help Chevron sell their pesticides. He worked their eastern farm territory that ran from Clovis to Reedley. For the past 38 years, he has been self-employed and operates a very successful insurance agency in Pacific Grove, California. On March 15, 2008, the Coalition of California Cities to Stop the Spray was organized and with help of his wife and a steering committee of, of dedicated individuals. The purpose of the group was to give voice to the large number of individuals through representation of their local elected officials. Confirming to the state of California the large number of individuals who opposed aerial spraying over urban and rural communities. A variation of Mike's original resolution was brought forth by Sonoma citizens to the city council here in Sonoma, which your mayor, Ken uh, Brown, announced earlier that had passed four to one here in this community. In less than three months, the number of Californians opposed to aerial spray grew so large that the people's voice was heard in Sacramento and aerial spray stopped. Just as for, for signatures, I think Stop the Spray has about 32,000 signatures. Uh, Stop the Spray Marin has like 4,000 signatures. We, we, you know, we've, we've, we probably have close to 50,000 signatures when we add up all the counties of people who are saying, no, we, we don't want this eradication program. We don't want our families and our land poisoned. The, um, today, uh, the need to continue to work to protect the people of California from unwarranted and un un unethical exposure to untested pesticides, um, the work continues to pass local rights ordinances based to prohibit, uh, to prohibit corporate chemical trespass in our communities. Please welcome Mike DeLay. Mike, the coordinator of Co Coalition of the California City. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Unique, for, for having this panel and this discussion here to help inform people. That's really what we did with the coalition, is we asked cities and, counts and people of their communities to become informed and involved in the light brown apple moth. Initially, going back in the beginning of this, uh, five minutes is a really short time, but I'll see what I can do. Um, we were sprayed, we were sprayed uh, September 13th, 2007, the first time. We were told about two weeks prior to the spray that it's safe, it's just a pheromone, there's a lot of food stuff in it, it's really safe, it's okay. Knowing pesticides, I didn't like it. So I took my wife and we left for the three days they were gonna spray. Uh, came back after we thought the spray was over, got back late the following night and they sprayed us that night. We didn't know that they could, you know, go longer than three days. My wife, within two hours of the, my wife has asthma, she's had it for years. We've con she's controlled her asthma with, with homeopathic stuff prior to the spray for three years with no symptoms, no, no problems at all. That night, her asthma returned with unbelievable results after they sprayed us. I mean, if you've ever been, I've never been in war, but when a plane flies over your house at 500 feet, I, I suppose that's what it sounds like because it was amazing and incredible what happened. Um, the, the, uh, uh, it scared everybody too. I mean, some people really enjoyed it. I thought it was interesting, but my wife was scared. But she woke up sick, you know, with asthma uh, occurring, nose running. I didn't have too much trouble with it at that, that point. Well, we were told, just stay inside. The next morning, it's okay. Go outside and wash off your stuff. It's safe. It's okay. So 
Um, we tried to do that. A couple of days later, a flu started, uh, a strange flu, no fever involved. Ran about two weeks. Uh, every, I, I followed two days behind, uh, behind her on this stuff. Strangest flu we ever had in our lives. Uh, it got so bad that I had to take my wife off the Monterey Peninsula, out of her home in Pacific Grove, and moved her to Sa Sa uh, Sa Sacramento with my daughter, where she stayed for two weeks, with the notion that if she got away, she'd get better, and this stuff would go away, and she could return. That was the idea. I brought her back two weeks later, and that night, her asthma came back chronically, almost uncontrollable. That night, I took her out and took her to Fresno to be with my sister for another two weeks, thinking, okay, that'll work. Brought her back. Now, while she's in Sacramento and Fresno, she has no asthma symptoms at all. And the moment she got off the peninsula, asthma stopped. Brought her back the second time. Within 24 hours, she's back in chronic asthma. We're barely to control it. Put her in the car and took her to our cabin up, up in the Sierras for another two weeks, thinking that this would then at least get rid of it. But during that time, they sprayed us a second time. I stayed. Um, as a result of that, we finally were able to get her home. Her asthma continues. We have it very, pretty well controlled now. Her symptoms are less. And this has been since, well, October 28th of 2007 was the last spray. Following that spray, I developed asthma symptoms. Never had it in my life. I also developed shortness of breath, thinking as though I was having heart troubles, which I don't. That lasted for about two months itself before it went away. During this time, we're, we're, we were so lethargic, so, it was so difficult to function during this whole time that we remembered in February of 2008, we started going, you know, we're feeling a little better, we think. I'm a healthy person, at least prior to the spray, and so is my wife. We don't get sick. We don't get colds rarely. We don't get the flu. But since the spray, we have been chronically sick. In fact, my wife is in a B&B a two doors down and has a cold right now, which is uncharacteristic of her. We have not been able to recover since this spray. Now, the, the, the whole purpose of what we experienced after the two sprays, we thought that we'll endure this and it'll be over. But in December of 07, we learned that the CDFA was coming back in April of 2008, once a month for nine months for the next three to five years and spraying the same thing. That's what they were going to do. Not only in Pacific Grove, but Santa Cruz, which was sprayed in November, by the way, with, with the second type of spray, Checkmate LBMF, but the Bay Area and, and, and Marin and Oakland. We had a choice. I'm a, I got 30 seconds. We have a choice in this whole thing, and that was close my business and move or stop the spray. We, we started the coalition of California cities with the idea, can we get enough resolutions to get mayors to sign on, take a paper to the governor, make a public issue of it, embarrass the heck out of Sacramento that the people want this stopped and stop them. What really happened though, which we didn't expect, was we had 2.5 million people represented by their local elected officials in opposition to aerial spray. Sacramento believed the people of, of 30, 30 cities and three counties created belief that consent occurred and the state of California stopped it. Thank you.